Well, as many of you are fully aware, tomorrow is Christmas Day. And sincerely, I do hope that you've done all your shopping by now. But if you haven't, then all I can say to you is Godspeed. <laughs> it's going to be pretty crazy out there. And I'm just telling you, just be careful. Because there are. There are a lot of unhinged people out there that don't care about anything besides themselves and what they need to get and do. So just be aware of that. Be patient today. Don't let the people, the crowds, just the mood um, get to you. And if you're that kind of person that gets easily triggered, just stay home. You know, just stay home and just put on some Christmas music, bake some cookies. I don't know. Just, you know, stay home. Don't go out there to the crowds. It's dangerous. It's nuts. I read a story about a woman doing last-minute Christmas shopping at a crowded mall. She was tired of fighting the crowds and was tired of standing in lines. She was tired of fighting her way down long aisles looking for that gift that had sold out days before. Her arms were full of bulky packages when an elevator opened up. It was full. The occupants of the elevator grudgingly tightened their ranks to allow the, a small space for her and all the stuff that she was carrying. And so as the doors closed, she couldn't help but to blurt out, whoever's responsible for this whole Christmas thing ought to be arrested, strung up, and shot. A few others nodded their heads or grunted in agreement. Then, from somewhere in the back of the elevator came a single voice that said, don't worry, they already crucified him. As many of you know, the most stressful part of shopping, especially around this time, is finding the right gift. If you love someone, you want to make sure you give them, the, give them something they really want so you can see the look in their faces, the joyous surprise when they open up that gift. But truthfully, you all know that it doesn't always happen. How many times have you seen someone open up a gift only to learn that it doesn't fit or isn't the right color or the box was broken or they already had one of what you got them. Or worse, all the hard work you put in to find the right present, you realize that it was for nothing when they tell you that it wasn't really what they wanted. Sure, they'll probably thank you and tell you, yeah, it's, it's nice. But you know by their look, by the look in their eyes and the tone in their voice that they're not impressed, they don't like it, when they, especially when they just put it aside and move on to the next thing and, and bury it under all the wrapping paper. You know when it's really important, really special, when they're holding on to it. It's right next to them. They don't want to let go of it. But, you know, you know when they don't like it. And so now you have to decide to return it and play the guessing game all over again or just let them do it themselves. This is the reason why December 26th, the day after Christmas, is considered a peak shopping day by many of the retail businesses from people returning or exchanging gifts. It can, be, it can also be really hard to find the right gift 
for someone who doesn't seem, who seems to have everything. And if they don't, there's no way you could afford to give it to them. So you scratch your head and wonder, what could I give him this year? What could I give her this year that isn't going to break me financially, that isn't, that is reasonable, that will show them that I care for them, that I love them, and that they mean a lot to me. And so this past week, I thought, I really thought about this, that same question. If I were to give Jesus a gift for his birthday, what could I possibly give him that he would appreciate? After all, as a second person of the Trinity, we know that he was there during creation. He is the creator of all things, according to Hebrews chapter 1, verse 2. And he's the one who holds all things together, Colossians chapter 1, verse 17. And so what can you possibly give to someone who not only has everything, but actually made everything? That's really a tough question. Have you ever wondered, is there anything the Lord would like for me this year? Is there anything that I can give to the Lord this Christmas day? Is there anything that I can give him that would bring a smile to his face? Well, church, those watching, listening, you don't really have to wonder about the answer to those questions. The Lord left a wish list for everyone to read and to know about. You see, the only, really, the only way to really know what to give someone is by simply asking the question, what would you like? Well, the answer to this question, what would you like, is found in a short passage in the little book of Micah that I'll be sharing with you today. It's possible you might have missed it, or perhaps you haven't even read the book of Micah. If that's the case, let me just give you just a short background on that book, because it's relevant here. It's in a section of the Old Testament we call the Minor Prophets, and it's titled After the Person Who Wrote the Book. Micah lived about 700 years before the birth of Christ, and scholars believe that he lived about the same time as the prophets Isaiah and Hosea. A character sketch of Micah would yield the following words and phrases. Blunt, direct, terse, plain-spoken, no-nonsense, a straightforward kind of a guy. Micah, you see, he loved, he did, he had a genuine love. He loved the common person, the common people, but he hated, he hated the religious and political leaders who were using their position to take advantage of those people. He hated the corruption. As a prophet, Micah was given a message by God of social reform for his generation. And he had to write it down. He wrote it down so the people wouldn't forget. Now there are three phrases that describe the situation of those days. And you tell me if they sound eerily familiar. 
It was international tension. Israel was caught between three warring nations, Assyria, Egypt, and the Philistines. The greater threat came from the Assyrians who had exacted tribute from Israel in exchange for peace. And so that kind of led to a voluntary, voluntary national slavery. It was also religious corruption. Again and again, Micah rallied. Again and again, Mikey, Micah, not Mikey, Micah railed against priests who took bribes and then said whatever the people wanted to hear. It made them feel good. Those religious leaders made the people feel good. They didn't call them out on their sin, on their evil actions, their disobedience to God. So it seems like all the leaders were on the take. And Micah was aware of that. And then there was moral chaos. This follows the first two. See, every, at that time, it was every man for himself. The rich ripping off the poor. The leaders taking bribes. And everyone cheating everyone else. The merchants couldn't be trusted. The leaders couldn't be trusted. You even weren't sure if you could trust the members of your own family. If you look at those three phases, international tension, religious corruption, moral chaos, one thing becomes clear. Micah lived in a day that isn't really much different than what we live, where, what in the time we live in today. His book, this book of Micah, could have been written in 2023. In some ways, the message sounds as if the prophet was reading the news headlines from CNN, Fox News, the Times of Israel, any news headline from those news apps. So Micah wrote to a world facing huge problems. And that's why it's so important today. He wrote condemning the sin and hypocrisy that was rampant among God's people. In no uncertain terms, he warned them of the judgment to come. He pulled no punches, and he took no prisoners. And so within this severe message from God, within those chapters is a beautiful passage of Scripture that is only three verses long. And there, within those three verses, it will tell you exactly what God wants from you for Christmas. And not just on Christmas, but the every day of your life. So if you brought your Bibles with you this morning, as I mentioned before, you can turn to Micah chapter 6. And I'm going to read... Verses 6 through 8. The Word of God says, What should I bring before the Lord when I come to bow before God on high? Should I come before Him with burnt offerings, with year old calves? Would the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams or with 10,000 streams of oil? Should I give my firstborn for my transgression, the offspring of my body for my own sin? Mankind, he has told each of you what is good and what is it the Lord requires of you? To act justly, to love faithfulness, and to walk humbly 
with your God. What does God want from his people? Well, to begin with, verses 6 and 7 tell us three things he doesn't want. Verse 6, in verse 6, God isn't interested, interested in the quality of sacrifice. The quality of sacrifice. What does he say there? What should I bring before the Lord when I come to bow before God on high? Should I come before him with burnt offerings? With year old calves? After hearing the warnings that Micah had previously given them, <coughs> the people, they began to wonder and they asked, What does God want from us? What does God want from me? Is he tired of getting from us the cheap quality? sacrifices and so they thought maybe God would be pleased if we just give him the very best that we have but the answer is no that's not what he desires so then they wonder in the first half of verse 7 if it's not about quality maybe it's the quantity of sacrifice again there says, would the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams or with 10,000 streams of oil? The idea is to impress God by offering those rams and creating a river of oil flowing through the streets. That's got to make God happy, right? That's what he wants. Surely that'll do the job. Surely that'll please the Lord. Again, they figured that an extravagant sacrifice would convince God of their sincerity. But here again, the answer is no. That's also not what he wants. Well, if it's not quantity, quality, and if it's not quantity, then it's got to be the ultimate sacrifice. In the second half of verse 7, Should I give my firstborn for my transgression, the offspring of my body for my own sin? It's almost as if they were saying, Geez, God, if it's not the one-year-old calves, 1,000 rams, or 10,000 streams of oil that you want, do you want us to make the ultimate sacrifice to you? Do we need to do what the other nations, the heathen nations, the idolatrous nations do and sacrifice their firstborn children? Would that make you happy? Is that what it's going to take to please the Lord and forgive them of their sins? But once again... The answer is no. He doesn't want the ultimate sacrifice. So I hope you've got the picture. This is a let's make a deal religion. Whatever you want, Lord, we'll do it. You name the price and we'll meet it. They actually thought that God would trade forgiveness for sacrifice. In essence, they thought that God could be bought just like their leaders. It's so typical of us as well when we try to make deals with God. Listen, if you've ever said something similar to this, Lord, I'll do anything you want. You name the price. You want a missionary? I'm ready to go. You want me to be married or stay single? I'm your man. Or a woman. Lord, I'll be a preacher or a pastor. 
I'll be a deacon or an elder. I'll pray every day and read my Bible. Whatever you want from me, that's what I'll do. I really mean it, Lord. Truthfully, there's nothing wrong, church, with those things. There's nothing wrong with those things. They're good and noble and proper. God is pleased when we offer ourselves to him. The issue is that those answers only deal with the outside. God doesn't want a payoff or exchange. What does he want? He wants your heart. You can be a missionary and have a hard heart. You can be married or single and have a rebellious heart. You can be very religious and yet far away from God. One of the things that I'm looking for for anybody that wants to serve here is do you have a heart for God? Do you have a passion for God? Believe me, I know what religious looks like. I used to play it all the time. I used to speak Christianese. I used to act the part. I know what it looks like. You know, and, and I know it's a hard thing. It's a hard thing to struggle with. But it's possible. It's possible to, to serve, to lead worship, to lead Bible study, to lead groups. It's possible to do all that and have a love and a passion for God. Nothing will get in your way of doing that. And you know, when you do it, it's not a burden. It's a joy. You're not doing it for me. You're not doing it for Pastor Isaac. You're serving, yes, the church. But more importantly, you're doing it for God. As you can see, God rejected every offer made by the Israelites. Why? Because they had completely missed the point. Again, they wanted to make a deal. And God didn't want that. He wanted their hearts. Well, this brings us to the right answer there in verse 8, which has been called the heart of the Old Testament religion and the greatest, one of the greatest verses in the Old Testament. This is one of those verses that you probably would want to memorize. Have it highlighted in your Bible. Have it bookmarked. Have it tattooed. No, never mind. Don't get it tattooed. Um, just have it nearby. If you remember it, write it on the card. Put it on a mirror every day so you can look at it. Or put it on a mirror so you can look at it every day. That verse there tells us exactly what God looks for in your life. I'm going to read verse 8 in the New Living Translation. Know, O people, the Lord has told you what is good, and this is what he requires of you, to do what is right, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Now, three things that God wants from us, wants from you. In our passage, Verse 8, to act justly, justice. The Hebrew, word for, the Hebrew word for justice is mishpat. Often in the Old Testament, often in the Old Testament, this word is applied to God's own character. If you didn't know this, God is just. He is absolutely fair and righteous with all his dealings. He's not like a common judge that can be bought off or a corrupt judge or 
No, he is the ultimate and perfect, just God. He gives to each person exactly what they deserve. Justice means treating people right because you know God. In the Bible, this concept is is applied in some very concrete ways. Caring for the poor, remembering the widows and orphans, not plowing on the corners of your field so the hungry could get food, speaking the truth, paying a fair wage, having honest scales, no cheating, no extortion, and refusing to take advantage of the less fortunate. And so for us at Christmas time, justice certainly means doing right to the less fortunate because we as believers, as Christians, we know God. Second one, in our passage and in the CSB, it says love, tra- love to love faithfulness. In some translations, it'll say mercy. In the New Living Translation, oh, it does say love mercy. Mercy, it speaks of the way we treat others. The Hebrew word hest, which means loyal love or patient love. It's a word that's sometimes translated His mercy endures forever and means loving the unlovely, unlovely, even when they don't love you back. Loving the unlovely, even when they don't love you back. It speaks to our obligation to care for people who don't care for us. Could you do that? Could you care for someone who has, doesn't like you, doesn't care for you, wants nothing to do with you? Would you still be able to care for that person? Here's a simple definition of mercy. Doing unto others as God has done unto you. Now, in a little over a week, 2023 will be history. It'll be in the books. It'll be in the past. But I want you to think about the last 12 months. This past year, how has God treated you this year? Has God blessed you? If he has, bless others. Has God forgiven you? Then forgive others. Has God lifted you up when you were down? Then lift others up when they're down. Has God overlooked your faults? Then, my friends, overlook the faults of others. In other places the, in the Bible, the word mercy is translated as lovely or beautiful. This means that mercy is a quality that makes you beautiful to others. It makes you beautiful to others. In other words, by showing mercy, people will think of you as beautiful. Now, you may not think that you're a beautiful person on the outside, and that really shouldn't matter. What really matters is the heart of a person. But if you want people to see you as beautiful, to see that beautiful quality in you, have mercy, love, have that loving kindness. Treat others respectfully. Treat 
treat them well. Sadly, we live in a world where people aren't treated very well. People are selfish. They're inward, inward focused. And even more sadly, there's a lot of people who will say they're Christians and who act the same way, who are unmerciful unlove, and, and unloving. As a believer, as a Christian, the world doesn't care how much love you have. It only cares that you share it with them. There's a lot of people out there that's around you. That's in your communities, in your, just in your sphere of influence that are holding a spiritual sign that says, Godless need his love and forgiveness. Please, please help. How often do you pretend not to see the need or the sign? But here's the thing. How can you attract non-Christians, those outside the walls here, those outside the church, when you don't share God's love with that hurting coworker, that Muslim that needs, or that Muslim acquaintance, that widowed neighbor, that classmate, that coworker, that person you see on a daily basis that's struggling with their sexuality. How are they supposed to know? How are they supposed to... Again, they're holding up signs saying, I need help. I need love, true love. And I need true forgiveness. But how can you do that if you don't share God's love? We need mercy at Christmas time. Don't you all agree? If God has been merciful to you this year, think about the occasions this past year how God's been merciful to you. I know He has certainly been merciful towards me. There are many times He could have poured out His wrath, His anger on me. He showed His mercy time and time and time again. And so if you feel the same way, if, if you've seen God's mercy in your life this past year, then be merciful. Be loving towards those around you. Ask the Lord this holiday season to help you to openly share your love and faith to those in need, to those who need it around you. Don't ignore it. Well, the third quality that God wants is humility. The word humbly comes from a Hebrew word that means modesty, modestly or carefully. It speaks of an attitude that is opposite of pride. What is humility, you may ask? It's having the right view of yourself because you have the right view of God. This is important for some of you. Some of you really need to hear this. Humility does not mean, does not mean saying, I'm nothing, I'm a worm, I'm useless. That's not humility. That's self-pity, which really is just another form of pride. And what is pride? It's having too large of a view of yourself because you have too small of a view of God. 
when your God is big, when you have an enormous God, you will be small. And pride will be impossible. Friends, this is humility. God made me, and I belong to him. Every good thing I have in life is a gift from the Almighty. Some may have more, some may have less, but that doesn't matter to me. I thank God for what I have, and I'm going to do the best I can with what God has given me. And I'm going to leave the outcome to him. That is humility. If we live that way, if you live that way, it will save you in so much, it will save you so much trouble, so many problems. You won't have to get into a power game at work or live in the rat race or sell out or sell your convictions to get ahead. You won't get angry at the silly comments people make. Humility enables us to be who we are in Christ. And we don't have to worry about what others think. So what does God want from you this year at Christmas time? Justice, mercy, humility. Rightly understood, those three words form the sum total of your Christian duty. If you have those things, God will be pleased. If you don't, nothing else makes really much of a difference. And so that brings us back to Micah. Why didn't God accept all the sacrifices? Why did he turn them down? Because they offered him everything except the one thing he really wanted. Their hearts. Their hearts. The religion God approves. The religion God approves is the religion of the heart. Outward religion is useless unless the heart belongs to God. All those things that you think you need to do in order to please God, all those, all those things that your church tells you that you have to do in order to be, have a right relationship with God, it's, it's not what he wants, friends. It's not what he wants, church. He wants your heart. He wants the real you. Do you even know who the real you is? Some still don't know. They're, just try, they're still discovering that. It's important that you find out the real you. Who is the real you? Now, if it's a person, if it's an ugly person, then maybe you know you need the Lord to transform you from the inside out. Maybe you don't know. Well, Lord can show you. He can tell you. He can reveal those things to you. But you have to surrender it. You have to surrender your heart to him in order for him to do that. He wants the real you, the person inside. You can fake a lot of religious activity, but the heart, it doesn't lie. It doesn't lie, my friends. What does God want from you at Christmas time? As every other day as well, and every other day as well, justice, mercy, humility. These are matters of the heart. This is why Jesus came. Matthew chapter 12, verse 18 says, He will proclaim justice to the nations. When Mary sang 
of Jesus' birth, she said, his, mirth, his mercy is from generation to generation on those who fear him. And then she went on to say, he has toppled the mighty from their thrones and exalted the lowly. See, this here is the heart of the gospel. What God requires, he gives to us. He came to establish justice. He came to show mercy. He came to lift up the humble. There's an Advent calendar that exists out there with the title, Do You Have Room? I don't know if you've seen it or not, but it's out there somewhere. It's, it's built around Luke chapter 2, verse 7. Where it says, then she gave birth to her firstborn son, and she wrapped him tightly in cloth and laid him in a manger, because there was no guest room available for, him, for them. If you were to open that advent calendar uh, there and, uh, and tear off the strips of paper, you will see uh, in those strips of paper, containing, it contains various contemporary excuses the innkeeper might give today. Sorry, it's dinner time. Don't interrupt me. I'm totally in a funk. I'm a mess right now. My house is a mess. I can't handle more company. Sorry, the Christmas pageant tonight. God bless you. Bye. Not now, I'm listening for tonight's lotto numbers. We're all gived out, can't afford to put up company. Sorry, can't. At this point, I don't know which end is up. Friends. Church, those watching, after 2,000 years, Jesus still knocks at the door of your heart. Will you make room for him before this year ends? Those here and those watching, the best gift you can give to God Today, right now, on the eve of his birth, as we celebrate the eve of his birth, is your heart. He wants your heart for Christmas. I want you to listen real quick. The words of, uh, from a song written by um, Christina Rossetti. She's actually the author of the words. A bit. Listen closely. To this and then ask this question what will you give Jesus this year what can I give him poor as I am if I were a shepherd I would bring the lamb if I What can I give him? What can I give him? I can give him my heart. Thank you, Isaac. You can give him your heart. You can give him your heart, ladies and gentlemen. Have you ever done that? Have you ever given him your heart? No decision in life, no decision is more important. And you know what? No one else can make it for you. Your parents can't make it for you. Your friends can't make it for you. Your pastor, your youth leader. 
No one else can make it for you. Because the truth is, if you aren't ready, if you aren't ready to give him your heart, then really there's nothing that I can say really or do to compel you to give him your heart. You have to choose to do that. You have to want to do that. I can, you can see me pour tears, or my tears could be pouring down my eyes and, and beg you to give your heart to Jesus. But that won't be enough if you're not ready to, to do that. You've got to make that decision yourself. It doesn't matter what people, what anybody else thinks. It doesn't matter what your mom thinks, what your dad thinks, what your friends think. This is a decision between you and God. And as I said, you can't fake it. He knows. He knows your heart. He knows if you're sincere or not. But if you are, if you are ready, then it's time for you to do business with the Lord. The Bible says in John chapter 1, verse 12, to all who received him, to those who believed in him, he gave the right to become children of God. I don't know, really, some of you, what's in your heart, what's going on there, what you've been through, what you've struggled with, all the sin that you've done. You, ha- you probably have this huge weight on your shoulders of all the sin that you're living with. Let me tell you, right now, today, Jesus can take that load from you. He can forgive you of your sins and set you free. So if you'd like to do that right now, if you'd like on this Christmas Eve to give your heart to Jesus and be born again, I want to invite you to the cross. I want to invite you to come to the cross and ask Jesus to be your Lord and Savior. So with all your heart, with all sincerity, I want you to bow your head and close your eyes. And I want you to pray this. Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. I admit it. And I ask you to forgive me. I truly believe that you died for my sins. And that three days later, you rose from the dead. So now I turn, I repent of those sins, Lord. I turn away from them and confess you and you alone as my Lord and Savior. Savior, I give you my heart today, right now. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for forgiving me of my sins. And thank you for saving me. So now I ask you to fill my heart. Fill it with the Holy Spirit. So that he may help guide me in my new born-again life. In your name, amen. If you pray that, please reach out to us. I want to hear from you. I want to hear what the Lord has done in your life. For those watching, again, I just want to thank you for checking us out. I, I, I just ask you, please share this message. 
It may change someone's life forever. God can use you in that way too. So I hope you have a great Christmas Eve, Christmas Eve, and that you have a wonderful and great Christmas morning. Until next time, we love you. Goodbye. Thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope you were blessed by Pastor Angel's message. For more information about Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, such as our service time or how to get connected, please visit our website at fvccelp.com. If the Lord is leading you to give to the ministry of Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, there's a PayPal link in the video description below. Once again, thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope to see you again soon.